I've always loved the idea of a West Marches style campaign. In short, that's a game of Dungeons and Dragons with dozens to hundreds of players and multiple GMs that all have their adventures in one shared collective world or region or town. And when I was first reading the rules for Blades in the Dark, one of the first things I thought was this game would be perfect for that style of play. Now, what is Blades in the Dark? Well, I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you're probably fairly familiar with the game, but for the uninitiated, Blades in the Dark is a tabletop role-playing game. It's narrative-focused and completely player-driven. Uh, said players take on the roles of scoundrels that form a small-time criminal crew in the city of Duskwall. Duskwall is sort of a haunted London analog. It's in perpetual night, there's ghosts everywhere, crazy magic, steampunk technology, the works. It's uh, sort of like Dunwall from the Dishonored games, but in my opinion, a heck of a lot cooler. Now, imagine that in that game, which tends to focus on conflict between criminal organizations, that the other gangs your players are interacting with are also led by your players. I thought that this was the coolest idea, and I actually attempted it. It went pretty well, and I was surprised at just how doable it was for one GM to handle. I think with minimal organization, anyone could do it. Now, for my specific game, I had 16 of my friends divided into four criminal enterprises. The drug-hawking Bowling Street Tinkatures, the arms-dealing Owls, the Menagerie, a group of assassins, and the Scovlin Sarist Army, a band of local ethnic terrorists. I used the default campaign setup described in the Blades in the Dark sourcebook. The Crows, the dominant criminal enterprise within the Crow's Foot district of Duskwall, have had their leader assassinated. And in the chaos, two smaller but still sizable gangs, the Lamp Blacks and Red Sashes, have risen up and gone to war with each other. The players take on the role of startup criminal gangs looking to capitalize on the bloodshed. I think the West March's style of play really enhanced the whole experience, made it feel like it was part of a bigger story. By and large, my players agree with this sentiment. In an anonymous survey that I kicked out to them post-campaign, almost all of them agreed that it was more fun than a standard one-party game of Blades would have been. Ditto with them feeling like they were part of a bigger story. I can't explain why exactly this was more fun, but it totally was, both from a GM's and apparently from a player's perspective. Now, like I said, anyone can do this. And so I'm going to spend the rest of this video giving some general advice for how to run a mega campaign in Blades in the Dark, and then I'm going to go specifically into how I set my own up. Now the number one piece of advice that I can give for someone that wants to do this is ensuring communication with and between your players. Now I know, communicating with your table is one of the most commonplace pieces of advice given to new GMs, but I mean it on a whole different level here. In a game like this, things can feel a little adversarial at times, especially if your campaign is like mine, where the setup is a literal gang war and you post a turf map that constantly updates if new territory is seized by gangs. It can feel like a board game. Things can feel a little player versus player. And if two of your player groups come into conflict, one of them is naturally going to lose. And losing at a board game, losing at a competition, especially one that you've put hours of time and effort into, is a bad, unfun feeling. And our job as GMs is to ensure that everyone at your tables is having as much fun as possible. That's why we play these games. Communicating and transparency is a way to alleviate this. During my game, I made sure that every group knew what every other group was up to well in advance of any plans coming to fruition. To this end, I streamed and uploaded every single session so that every player could keep up with what's going on in the campaign. While secret plans and ambushes are really cool narratively, it can be unfun to be on the receiving end, to be blindsided by such an ambush. And if two of my groups wanted to go to war with each other, I'd dump them in a group chat and say, okay, what do both sides want out of this war? How is it going to be fought, and what are some cool things that we want to have happen in the process? For example, I probably wouldn't allow a group of bravos to just march in and all-out assault a hawker group's base. You know, bravos are a combat group. 
It would be a one-sided bloodbath, and bloodbaths generally aren't fun for everyone involved. Instead, I might suggest that the Hawkers go and try and persuade uh, one of the Bravos' allies to betray them and join the Hawkers while the Bravos are assaulting their drug den. And it's a race against time. Can the Hawkers persuade their allies before the Bravos crush their defenses? You know, something that allows all of the players to shine. Although, just as often, the two groups might realize they don't really want to go to war in the first place. This was almost exactly the case early on in my campaign. On one of their first scores, Bowling Street Tinkatures fought off a hitman sent to get them by the Scoblin Saurist army. They decided that this constituted an act of war. Now, after that session, when I got them all into a group chat and we talked it out, they all kind of realized that they didn't really want to go to war. It would distract their gangs from their respective endeavors and just kind of drag on. It wouldn't be very fun or very dramatic. So, we invented narrative reasons for the war to be avoided and just moved on. Easy as that. Notice how in that conversation, my players were motivated by what is dramatic and what is fun, not what will make them win. See, if the Scovlin Sarist army was just out to win the campaign, they would walk in and smack down Bowling Street Tinkatures, and then move on to the other player-led groups, killing all of them one by one. That would suck. It would be fun for maybe a quarter of my players and end the campaign in short order. Adversarial thinking can lead to a pretty bad Blades in the Dark campaign. At its core, this isn't a player v player game. Blades in the Dark is a narrative rule set. To instill this mindset in my players, I let them know what kind of campaign this was at the outset. I told them all that despite the map, we're not here to play a board game. We're not here to win the campaign. Instead, we're here to build a cool and dramatic story. Our focus is drama, not victory. And so, when my players understood this, when the campaign started, we all worked to do just that, build a story. And it was awesome. Make sure that before your game begins, your players are all on board with what it is you want to do. If you want to build a really cool, kick-ass story about a bunch of criminal gangs fighting or working together to stop a common foe, tell your players that. And if you'd like an adversarial board game style competition, which I don't recommend, tell them beforehand. Set expectations and attitude before any dice get rolled. The final and perhaps most effective way to eliminate bad feelings and adversarial thinking in this game is through the implementation of NPC factions. Notice how with my campaign setup, I had a bunch of big scary NPC factions ready to go, while the players were just nobodies at the bottom of the ladder. The Crows, the Lamp Blacks, the Red Sashes, these are all really enticing bad guys for the player characters to take on. They didn't have to fight each other directly. And this is critical for two reasons. One, it means that the player gangs don't have to fight each other. On a given score, they'll just be fighting an NPC faction using them as sort of punching bags to advance their own cruise narrative and progress the meta-narrative of the gang war in Crow's Foot. The second implication is that it allows player gangs to go into conflict with each other without ever directly fighting, because the player gangs naturally allied with some of these NPC gangs, some sided with the Crows, some with the Lamp Blacks. And so it allowed proxy wars. Instead of player gang A directly fighting player gang B, Gang A simply fights B's NPC allies, and vice versa. These approaches together all really helped the game run smoothly, and my players agreed. They also pretty much universally felt like it wasn't adversarial. They didn't feel like they were really competing against each other to win some kind of contest. And so these three things, communication, expectation setting, and NPC faction usage, should be, if nothing else, your main takeaways from this video. Before we fully move on from this, let's quickly talk about PvP. Direct player versus player conflict only occurred once in my campaign. It was pretty much the entirety of the final session. A dramatic battle over a bridge between three of my four player groups and a bunch of their NPC allies. 
a lot of players were killed or maimed, and it was really dramatic. But not very fun. A few of my players did like the final session, but even they agreed that PvP was one of its weakest elements. Only a quarter of my players liked PvP, which makes a lot of sense. Blades in the Dark is not designed for players to fight other players, especially not to the death or in any sort of organized pitched battle. The rules simply aren't built to accommodate that style of play. And so, honestly, I recommend avoiding PvP in your game altogether. I will admit that that does make concluding gang war style games really hard. I suppose you could conduct the ending through proxy war like I did most of my campaign through, or you could just really, really clearly set expectations with your players. Let them know how PvP is going to work, that their player characters probably will die or get seriously injured, and just make sure they're all totally on board with it before you begin. Or you could just not do a gang war setup, you know? Um, they could all be criminal gangs that have to unite against some big, large, intimidating force like a military invasion. Or, as my friend Julian, who played Drahaslav in the Mega Campaign, suggested, all of the player groups could be different arms of one big criminal organization, never directly fighting, but always jockeying against each other for power or to undermine their collective leader and gain control of the Enterprise. There are a lot of ways to set up this Blades in the Dark campaign, and it doesn't need to be directly adversarial in any kind of way. Whatever way you do it, PvP did not work very well for me, and I don't know that there's a way it can be done well in Blades, but you're welcome to try. By the way, your game doesn't need an overarching mega plot. You know, like, there doesn't have to be a gang war, and the players don't have to be united by some common force. Maybe they all just chill and do their own thing in one shared collective world. That's cool, too. One of my groups, Bowling Street Tinctures, explicitly did not want any part of the gang war in Crowsfoot. They wanted to be neutral and just make money off of the conflict. And you know, that was fine. Their sessions were really fun. They allowed me to explore other parts of the settings away from Crowsfoot. It was a blast. That being said, if you do want all of your player groups to engage with the meta-narrative, make sure they know that in advance. I didn't mandate it as part of my game, so it was totally okay that Bowling Street didn't want any part of the war. But whether your players are engaging in a meta-narrative, or doing their own thing, or conducting PvP if you're allowing that, your number one priority should be making sure that all of the player characters look like badasses, look really cool. You know, when they win, it's because they're very skilled and intelligent and sneaky. And when they lose, it's because luck wasn't on their side or their foes were insurmountable. When they fail, try not to describe them as incompetent. They're cool. Their characters are really able and skilled scoundrels. Make sure everyone looks cool, win, lose, or draw. Well, that should be your main priority when you're actually running the game. Your main priority overall for the campaign uh, should be your own sanity. You know, I almost completely burned myself out running this mega campaign. Handling multiple groups is a lot. I was doing two sessions of Blades in the Dark every weekend, on top of my Mothership and Delta Green campaigns. I was also a full-time student and writing my undergrad thesis. I was super busy, and I often came into these sessions exhausted. If it wasn't for a couple weekends I took off here and there, I think I would have had to call the campaign off early and just end it there. You know, this stuff can get tough. So take it easy on yourself. Take breaks if you need to. And your groups don't need to play every week. They can play every other week, every month, every other month. Space things out as much as you need to maintain your own mental well-being and sanity. Right? You know, your mental health should probably take precedence over your mega campaign. On one final note here before we move on to the next section of the video, I want to talk about rules. Now, Blades in the Dark is hands down the best rule system I have ever read. I love pretty much everything about it. That said, it's not designed to handle four groups of players at once. There gets to be a lot to keep track of. And so for my campaign, I ignored like half the rules. 
healing, for example. I made healing way easier. Gave my players extra dice. Made it so they didn't have to roll to acquire a doctor. Ignored most of the negative modifiers for things like, you know, taking level one and two harms. I also made crafting way easier, so everyone got to build a cool gadget at least once per campaign if they wanted to. We had like four leeches, so there was a lot of crafting going on. I ignored most of the more complicated entanglements and faction rules to keep things moving. I know that it's universal that any GM can modify any game system's rules at their table, uh, but I'm going to especially encourage you to do that here. Like I said, there's a lot to keep track of, and lightening the load on yourself and your players can make things a heck of a lot easier. Of all the decisions I made, lightening the rule set was the most universally liked one amongst my players. They all thought it was a good thing to do for the campaign. Just keep in mind, whatever rules you decide to modify, make sure you keep it consistent for the other groups. If I made a decision for one group during a session, for the rest of the round, I made sure that that ruling stayed as precedent for everyone else in order to keep things feeling fair. So keep precedence in mind. Okay, so that's it for general advice. I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking specifically about how I set up my campaign. If you want a live action example of this in the works, uh, it's all available here on this YouTube channel. But that's like 40 hours of RPG content, so I'm just going to summarize it here. To start off, I dumped all 16 of my players into a Discord server. I told them to organize themselves into criminal gangs of four. Two things needed to be true for all these gangs. One, they all needed to agree what kind of criminal gang they wanted to be, and two, they all had to have a day that worked every other week with their schedules and with my own. This went really smoothly, and in like a couple days I had four criminal gangs with all having slots filled on the roster to play a game on the same date every other week with me. And if a player couldn't make it on a certain day, well, they just have to sit out for that session. It worked pretty much perfectly. Spreadsheets are a lifesaver. I highly recommend using one for organization. This Discord server also served as a repository for opportunities. At the start of the first couple rounds, I posted a list of eight opportunities that player gangs could seize in order to determine what they were going to do for a score that day. Stuff like, uh, you know, a bank caravan is going to be vulnerable in the streets tomorrow, or a local politician wants his rival assassinated, and they'll pay you to do it. These were all first come, first serve. First gang to message me got to go on that score. Also in this server, I'd post a bi-weekly newspaper, which was more just for fun and atmosphere and to recap what happened during the prior round. I'd also post a faction sheet. Uh, this contained information that's important for the players going into a round. It would tell them what new NPCs were in town to keep track of. It would update them on the various goals and progress of the NPC faction towards their own ends. It also contained a, a bi-weekly district-wide event. Uh, this is a one-off effect that would apply for one score and then be done with. It, it's stuff like every player in the game gets a free four slices on their healing clock. This is in addition to a district-wide gang war escalation. This was a permanent modifier that I'd add every round that would affect every score from here on out. Stuff like all scores are now at plus one reputation and plus one heat because the newspapers are paying attention. Also, because I'm a nerd who loves maps, I'd regularly update a turf map of the city of Duskwall to just track who owned what. All of those pieces of turf corresponded to a list with all of the benefits for seizing that turf listed. If your gang spent a score seizing territory, you'd gain the listed benefit. The uh, format for all of this stuff is going to be linked in the description. This system of picking opportunities really only lasted for the first two of five rounds. Oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, the campaign only lasted for five rounds. Every crew only had five sessions. Uh, because we're all full-time students, and I felt that the odds of us having non-conflicting semester schedules twice in a row was essentially zero. The whole campaign had to fit neatly into one academic semester. Uh, and so I had to pace things really quickly. Uh, the scale of threats upped itself pretty high every single session. But anyway, by round three, session three for all of the individual crews, everyone had sort of latched on to a particular path that they wanted their crew to take. So there wasn't a need for these opportunities. Everyone knew what they wanted to do and accomplish by the end of the campaign. 
The Scovs declared war on the state and spent round three blowing up a police station. The Bowling Street Tinkatures decided to fix the World Series and worked closely with a criminal contact at Charter Hall College. The Owls decided that they were going to deal arms to the Lamplacks in order to help them win the war. And the Menagerie assassinated my favorite NPC on his birthday, plunging the district into chaos. So after round three, the game sort of transitioned into a second stage where everyone was pursuing their own things that they pitched to me instead of me going directly to them with all of these opportunities. Everyone found their niche, their story they wanted to tell, which tended to overlap with the other gang stories. My groups were 100% divided on which of these two stages they liked more, the opportunity-based sort of free play stage one and the narrative-driven high-stakes stage two. Despite this, Everyone's favorite session, or almost everyone's favorite session, was in stage two. Although, on the other hand, everyone's least favorite session was also in stage two, so go figure. Stage four, round four, uh, served as a sort of mini-climax before the final round of the campaign, where everyone was squaring things away, tying up loose ends before concluding the overall mega plot which ended with round five, a dramatic pitched battle between everyone for control over Conway Bridge. When the dust settled, I spent ten some odd minutes going over a series of vignettes that described where all of the players and the NPCs ended up. I think that in particular specifically was a nice end to the campaign, even if overall session five was probably the weakest. Overall, this was just so much fun. Probably my favorite campaign that I have ever gotten to run. I enjoyed every solitary second of it. But one final note. You are going to deliver an imperfect product to your players. You're going to make bad calls, make undramatic decisions, accidentally foster conflict between your players. You're going to be a poor referee at times. You might even botch the final session of your mega campaign with bad PvP design. I did all of these things, but you know, when asked if my players would play in this campaign again, given the opportunity, every single one of them said yes. Your players are going to have a lot of fun. And I think you will too. Good luck.